This painting by Louis Jean Francois Lagrenier depicts the moment during which the Roman envoy Gaius Popilius Linus confronted the powerful Seleucid monarch Antiochus IV in 168 BCE, after this king had invaded and conquered nearly the whole of Egypt, which was ruled at the time by the Ptolemaic dynasty. Now, uh, conflict between these two powers should be no surprise. The Seleucid dynasty, which ruled Hellenistic Asia, and the Ptolemies of Egypt were bitter rivals who fought each other constantly, mostly for the possession of the rich coastal cities of the southern Levant, also called Koile Syria. However, Meanwhile in Rome, the Senate was not all too pleased after hearing about Antiochus' attempt to expand his influence southward. They immediately sent a certain Gaius Popilius Linus to the campaigning Hellenistic king in Egypt. And this envoy demanded he withdraw his troops from the land of the Nile immediately. After Antiochus had requested some time alone with his counselors, the bold Linus defiantly drew a circle around the king with a stick and stated the famous words Before you step out of that circle, give me a reply to lay before the senate. Perplexed by such an audacious move, Antiochus realized the seriousness of Rome in this matter and he evacuated Egypt instantly. Now, why did the Seleucid king attack the Ptolemaic Empire in the first place? Why was he so successful initially? And why did he give up on Egypt so easily? This video will focus on this war, the last of the great conflicts between the two major successor states of Alexander the Great, the Ptolemaic Empire and the Seleucid Kingdom. The Seleucid Kingdom was the largest of the Hellenistic successor states obtaining nearly all of Alexander the Great's Asian conquests after his death in 323 BCE. And the center of this empire was the region of Syria, with its many Seleucid colonies. And their power had been seriously reduced, however, after King Antiochus III, better known as Antiochus the Great, had been defeated by the armies of Rome at the Battle of Magnesia in modern-day Turkey in 190-189 BCE. After this defeat, the Seleucid dynasty consented to the Treaty of Apamea, promising Rome to never cross the Taurus mountain range, so the mountains separating Asia Minor and Syria, ever again. The monarch, Antiochus the Great, also had to pay large reparation costs to Rome in several installments which were not completed after his death, so which had to be continued by his successors. Another important point to which Antiochus the Great agreed was uh, the sending of Seleucid princes to Rome as hostages, with these members of the royal family at the mercy of the Senate the Seleucid rulers were efficiently kept in check by the Republic. The most powerful states in the Near East had thus been humbled by the Romans. The Seleucid Kingdom, nevertheless, remained the most powerful kingdom of the Eastern Mediterranean. They, however, never dared to challenge the Romans ever again. It was clear that against the legions of Rome, there can be no victory, and they therefore remained well behaved outside the confines of Asia Minor and continued to pay the reparation costs and kept sending Seleucid princes to the capital of the Roman Republic. Such was a situation in 175 before the Common Era the year in which R. Antiochus IV ascended the throne. He was the younger son of uh, the previously mentioned Antiochus the Great, having succeeded his older brother uh, Seleucus IV after he had died. 
Now, the circumstances of Seleucus' death are rather unclear. Some claim that Antiochus had nothing to do with it and others state that he orchestrated the whole affair. In any case, he swiftly took matters into his own hands and secured his succession to the throne, outmaneuvering the rightful heir of the empire in doing so, Seleucus, his son uh, Demetrios, so his nephew. Demetrios was in fact held up as a hostage in Rome, giving Antiochus enough time and space to usurp the crown. The cunning man was well informed of the Mediterranean geopolitics at the time, and used this to his advantage. There was in fact an anti-Roman and anti athlete movement brewing among the other Hellenistic and Middle Eastern kings. Antiochus promised to the Atalids, consequently, that if they helped him in securing, in usurping the throne, he would become a faithful supporter of the Romans and the Atalids in the Middle East. Pergamon agreed and promptly put Antiochus on the throne in Syria. And the Romans, the closest allies of the Atalids, went along with their decision and consequently kept Demetrios at Rome, giving way to Antiochus to consolidate his newly acquired power. Now that we have lined out the situation uh, of the Seleucid Kingdom, let's take a look at the other side of the Sixth Syrian War, the Ptolemaic Empire, the Egyptian Ptolemaic Kingdom. Well, Meanwhile, in Egypt, the dynasty of the Ptolemies was even worse off than their northern neighbors. More than 20 years before Antiochus IV ascended the throne, Egypt had become embroiled in yet another conflict with the Seleucids during the so-called Fifth Syrian War. Now, the Syrian Wars were, as I've said in the introduction, a series of conflicts between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, with the main stake being the control of southern Syria, of Koile Syria, so the southern Levant with its rich coastal cities. And these were traditionally in the possession of Egypt, but were claimed constantly by the Seleucids. And normally these uh, Syrian wars uh, between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies ended more or less uh, in the favor of Egypt. But not this time, not during the Fifth Syrian War. Antiochus the Great, the father of Antiochus IV, had namely decisively defeated Egypt and consequently conquered the Southern Levant. Egypt continued to regard, nevertheless, Koile Syria as their lawful province. But any attempt to re-establish their authority there was thwarted by a series of indigenous revolts that plagued the land of the Nile during the early 2nd century BCE. The loss of Koile Syria and these incessant rebellions had turned Hellenistic Egypt into a mere shadow of its former self. At the time of Antiochus IV's reign, so we're back in the late uh, 170s BCE, Egypt was controlled then by two regions, Laios and Lenaios, and they ruled instead of Ptolemaios VI, who was still a minor. These uh, Eulaios and Lenaios were incapable men, however, and soon came to be hated by many of the most powerful figures in the government. Uh, this is for many a crucial point uh, to understand the causes of the Sixth Syrian War, a part about which our sources sadly remain rather vague. Elaios and Lenaios, in fact, started to agitate the populace of the capital Alexandria against the Seleucids and managed to rally their support in a war against their northern neighbors. So it were the Ptolemies under Elaios and Lenaios who started the war. Why? 
Some suspect that Elios and Lenaios desperately looked for a way to remove all the negative attention around them uh, from their shoulders and put all the focus of Egypt onto a new war. Perhaps they also seriously thought that they could reconquer Koile Syria and thus uplift their popularity. In any case, uh, the only thing they provided Egypt with was ruin. They were in fact not in the least ready for a great war with Antiochus, while the Seleucids were. As I have said before, the Seleucid Empire, despite its defeat at the hands of the Romans, still remained one of the most powerful states in the Mediterranean. The Seleucid king, in any case, had already assembled a large army at the time the war broke out. Some might interpret this as proof that Antiochus IV was actually already preparing for a war with Egypt and that this aggressive stance provoked the Ptolemies to declare war themselves. It is also possible, however, that these troops were being assembled to march to the eastern provinces beyond the Zagros, so the mountain range between modern-day Iraq and Iran. There, the Seleucid provinces, in fact, were under attack by the Parthians, who were a serious menace uh, to the eastern part of the Seleucid Empire. Now, what did Rome do in this situation? Well, Rome was actually, at that very moment, preoccupied with their own war, a strenuous one at that, against Macedonia. Because of this, the Seleucid king might have thought that he could get away with an invasion of Egypt, despite his wish to never agitate the Romans. Besides, the Treaty of Apamea, signed by his father 20 years before, probably said nothing about the Seleucids breaking out uh, of their southern borders. This he could use as an excuse if the Roman Republic did become angered about the war. It is important here to point out that the Seleucid monarch, at first, probably had no intention of actually annexing the land of the Nile and adding it as a province to his empire, but rather desired to bring the Ptolemaic Empire into his sphere of influence. The Ptolemaic king, uh, Ptolemaios VI, was still very young and thus perhaps easy to manipulate thought uh, Antiochus IV. Although the war began officially in 170 BCE, the fighting actually started in 169 BCE, so one year later. The Seleucid armed forces were quick to defeat the Ptolemaic army near the city of Pelusium and afterwards capture the city of Pelusium itself. Now, Pelusium was the easternmost city of Lower Egypt and basically the last line of defense before enemy troops could flood into Egypt itself. The Ptolemies, now without a proper army, quickly removed Elaios and Lenaios from power. Ptolemaios VI was declared of age and effectively started his reign. To strengthen the royal house, uh, his sister-slash-wife, Cleopatra II, and his younger brother, Ptolemaios Fuscon, were appointed co-regents, so uh, a triarchy uh, started in the kingdom. The Ptolemies then opened negotiations with the Seleucids in order to end the unfavorable war. Ptolemaios VI met Antiochus IV personally, and they agreed to some sort of treaty, uh, of which the content remains obscure. The Seleucid position of Coelisiria was probably reaffirmed, and Ptolemaios VI might have accepted some sort of Seleucid overlordship. I repeat, we are not entirely sure what was promised. But there must have been something of substance promised here to the Seleucids, because later on, as we will see, the uh, revoking of this, of whatever was promised, angered Antiochus so much that he invaded Egypt again. 
the population of Alexandria, of the capital, however, was not pleased with this situation and they revolted and quickly put Ptolemaios Fuscon, the younger brother, on the throne as a sole ruler. Antiochus IV immediately set course for Alexandria in order to restore the rightful ruler and probably his protégé, Ptolemaios VI. A protracted siege of Alexandria followed, which remained without result. Antiochus was eventually forced to leave Egypt due to the news of a sedition among the Jews in Jerusalem, thus exposing uh, the rear of the Seleucid army. While Antiochus was busy restoring order in Jerusalem, Ptolemaios Fuscon and Ptolemaios VI reconciled and the co-rule of the three siblings of the Ptolemaic siblings was re-established. Antiochus invaded Egypt again and probably because this renewed friendship among the brothers meant that Ptolemaios VI disregarded his earlier promises wherever they were to Antiochus. The Seleucid monarch conquered Pelusium again and an expeditionary force was sent this time to take Ptolemaic Cyprus. It was around this time that the Senate in Rome started to pay serious attention to the whole affair. Victory in Macedonia was getting closer and closer and the Senate could start to look forward and preoccupy themselves with other affairs. Ex-consul Gaius Popilius Linas was sent as an envoy in the spring of 168 BCE in order to demand peace between the two kingdoms and probably the re-establishment of the status quo. So the situation between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies before the war. Linus traveled via Greece and his confidence was probably boosted after receiving the news about the decisive Roman victory over the Macedonians at Pudna. The Roman legions had yet again proven their superiority over the phalanxes of the Hellenistic kings. Antiochus had in the meantime captured the old Egyptian capital Memphis whence he started to coordinate his military operations against the current capital of the kingdom, Alexandria. Victory became a matter of time for the Seleucids. The countryside around the port capital was being ravaged and plundered, and the Ptolemaic armies elsewhere offered no serious resistance. It was at Eleusis, a suburb of Alexandria just to the east of the city walls, that the rampaging Antiochus was confronted by the Roman envoy. As said at the beginning of this video, Linus quickly forced the Seleucid king into giving up his conquest and to retreat into the heartlands of the Seleucid kingdom, Syria. I have told the rather sensational story of how this came about, but why? Why did Antiochus give up so rapidly? Well, there are multiple explanations that are possible. First of all, Antiochus knew very well what the Romans were capable of. He was about 25 years old when his father was crushed by the legions of the Republic at the fields of Magnesia. He subsequently spent some time as a hostage at Rome. A deeper knowledge and perhaps even a profound respect for the Romans and their nearly unstoppable military power must have resulted from his long stay at the heart of the Republic. Before and after the Sixth Syrian War, he was always eager to please the Romans and ensure their friendship. Another explanation is that the Romans still had the rightful heir to the throne, his nephew Demetrios, in custody, whom they could unleash upon Antiochus at any given time. Fighting a civil war against a pretender who was backed by the Romans must have seemed an unattractive prospect indeed. In any case, Antiochus retreated and probably agreed to the Roman demand never to set foot in Egypt ever again. The Ptolemies, however, did not fare any better than their enemy, 
One could say that uh, Egypt was even worse off than the Seleucid Kingdom. Whereas the Seleucids still maintained complete independence, Egypt basically became a Roman protectorate and would remain so until Emperor Augustus would annex the country some 150 years later. Antiochus, although curbed from any further military enterprise in the eastern Mediterranean, was still allowed to do as he pleased inside his kingdom and to the east of his empire. This is exactly what he did. His new focus became to subdue the ever more serious Jewish revolt and to reestablish firm control over Iran where the Parthians beleaguered the Seleucid provinces. But this is a subject for another video.